John, Montreal Gatling, John, Gordon, Adrian, Kurt, and Cameron. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of my British and Scottish brothers. And Canadian. <laughs> and Canadian. Well, we try not to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Miss uh, Lancaster, you got in the background there, Adrian? Yeah, that's the uh, one that flies out of uh, Hamilton, our uh, right. one that was restored. And yeah. if you look at the front, it's actually the uh, VC one. All right. Yeah, that's that's the VC uh, badge at the front of it for the uh, uh, the story behind it um, was that the rear gunner was trapped. So one of his buddies went back to help him and mm -hmm. couldn't get him out. So he finally said, hey, let me just, just go save yourself. So the other guy jumped out. Meanwhile, his parachute had burned, so he fell to his death. The Lancaster crashed and with a full payload exploded on impact, blowing the rear gunner part out. And he landed on a rooftop on a farmhouse, was rescued by the, farm, uh, by the farmer and was given to the French resistance where he came back. The Lancaster itself, this is all done with his um actual colors and call sign and everything and wow. it still flies out of hamilton on a regular basis didn't it's we one of two one? left didn't we one have that two one left in here. the world sorry i'm sorry didn't, didn't we have that one over here a couple of years ago for um yeah yeah, the, yeah the, you you have one and we have one yeah. and those are the only two left uh functioning in the world so Impressive That's the story there. behind this one. <laughs> Another little story, which uh, you may or may not know. There was, um, near the end of the Second World War, when the Americans were playing around with their nuclear weapons, it was, uh, they were very, very close to using Lancasters rather than the aircraft they used. The reason being that the aircraft they used had a spar going through the bomb bay where the wings were attached. So, mm -hmm. and the Lancaster didn't. So they either had the choice of either using British aircraft, which would have probably put the nose slightly out of joint, or modify the aircraft they were going to use. And history says they modified. <laughs> so, uh, sorry for the late start. I'm normally on here at quarter two, giving people time to come in, but uh, looks like all of you were like, queued up at the door, as it were. <laughs> Uh, and Gordon's here, so we have our speakers, so that's all that matters, right? Hopefully. We had a, uh, had a great time uh, at Luray Caverns. Uh, it was very, um, very interesting. Uh, the the uh, Luray Caverns, I'm not sure if it's a Mason or a senior DMLA or someone who's the original owner or manager of the place, but the DMLAs have been there like 48 years in a row. Uh, we get to come in and do our DMLA degree down in the bottom most cavern. It's uh, it's very cool. I'm going to, I got a picture here I'll throw up here of, I took when I was in there. Let's see. Let me share my screen real quick. If I can do this, yeah. Um, not to share. Browser. Some of these are a little blurry, but these are the caverns in Luray. These are all naturally formed caverns. They were discovered, I think, 1878 or something, and they uh, put down some paths and put in some lighting. And, uh, it's just beautiful. They charge people to come through and take the tours. Uh, they're open year round. And okay. it's from the Demolay degree. Uh, my son plays Jacques Demolay. It's the uh, for those who aren't familiar. It's uh, the the second degree in Demolay is they show the trial of Jacques Demolay being persecuted by the uh, Inquisition, and then the um, Lord Constable comes in from the king and says, screw it, we're gonna, we're gonna put him on the stake. So that's my son playing Demolay. And then you see some of the caverns. So this, this is one big cavern. They have a, an organ, believe it or not, 
that they've tied to, they've connected to some of the larger stalactites that they actually play music on. There's the guards, all the prisoners, and then just different views of the caverns. I got one of the, there's the whole scene. So I'm way in the back here, but we have all the seats set up and the, the DMLA has performed the degree at the front. We got one shot of the, the three inquisitors marching in. Oh, and there's our order giving the talk beforehand. That was backwards, but at the beginning, the order comes out. That's the typical DMLA dresses. We have these um, robes that the boys wear for formal occasions and these cloaks. And um, he gives a talk about explaining what the DMLA degree is about and so on. So, so that's what I did last weekend. That's why I wasn't here with y'all. But it was a lot of fun. Had about 200 people came down in the caverns to watch the degree. And uh, several members of my son's chapter were on the degree team. It was pretty cool. So I never know how many people to expect. We're looking to come up on 10 after, so we'll probably start with Gordon in a minute. Um, anybody got any announcements, anything going on they wanna share with us? I'm gonna go grab a drink before we start. So Brian, entertain the crowd. Oh, no problem, I'll just do a quick song and dancing. No, no problem at all, mate. You've got the world with you, Brian, just now. Sorry? You've got the whole world with you in Cornwall just now. We have, yeah, every man and his dog. Yeah, it's really, really exciting. <laughs> My sympathies, we tried to keep him over here, but he insisted on going. <laughs> oh, they're, they're mainly harmless. Um, they're sort of behaving themselves nicely. We've sort of, there's one lovely little story. Um, Blair and Biden were, not Blair, my God, I show my age, and wishes. Um, Johnson and Biden were supposed to be meeting on a little island just off the, off the coast. And um, they decided that they couldn't do it because it was too misty and the helicopters couldn't land there. <laughs> so, so they had to throw a, a meeting in a hotel instead, which was completely different from what they expected. Um, that link, I'm just posting a link in the chat um, about that story about the um, Lancaster that uh, was going to be used as a um, to drop the nuclear weapons. And also while we're dropping links. Um, That's the one about the uh, Lancaster, the guy why he got the Victoria Cross. Aren't you brilliant? And while we're at it, while he's not there, while the cat's <laughs> dog's away, or the cat's I'm away. Like, I'm watching you at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see us getting more people, so we may just go with what we have. Um, oh, thank you, uh, Brother Adrian, for the info there. Um, let's see. Most every, oh, oh, good. Brother Day's here. Um, most of us are repeat offenders here. I think Brother Adrian, I believe you're new. Yes, I okay. am, but I deal with Brian all the time in England. Okay, well then you have my sincere condolences. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, Thank you. Brian, Brian is our lovely co-host. He does a wonderful job helping me out. My, uh, my Ed McMahon to my uh, Johnny Carson and all y'all should be old enough to know that even those of you across the pond should be able to get the reference. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to Virginia Research Lodge's weekly unstated meeting. Um, we have a Facebook group. I just put the links in the chat. First link is our Facebook group. You're welcome to join. Um, then we have our Lodge website where we store all of our research papers and other useful things. And then uh, our YouTube channel that I manage that has all of our um, all of our previous unstated means go on YouTube and I'm two weeks behind, but the one from the uh, 29th, whatever it was in May, will be up there shortly, but I'm behind in things. So that's where we are. Um, so we do post that uh, in a somewhat timely fashion to get them up there on YouTube. So if you want to see a previous one, they're there. I don't edit them much unless I need to. I know I'm a good, doing a good job when the, uh, when the author gets mad and says, I'm cutting out all of his good bits as Brother Carson told us, Brian. <laughs> he, 
<laughs> I can't believe he edited all the good parts. Uh, generally, I let the speakers run free and um, and talk as long as they want to talk, as long as it's interesting. But there's a few times where I've had to step in in the middle and, and edit it out. It's like, no, I don't think everybody needs to hear the entire history of all of the um, all of the uh, uh, production factories that made Masonic regalia and how they all merged with each other back in the 1890s and stuff. It's like, it's not that important. I'm sorry. <laughs> he kind of dragged a little bit, but for the most part, his talk was interesting, but I felt the need to edit a little bit. Anyhow, um, I, as most of you all know, we do, uh, this is sponsored by Virginia Research Lodge number 1777, which meets in Highland Springs, Virginia. It is open to all Masons and Occasionally, the non-Masons who are interested in Masonic stuff, we're not that restricted here. And uh, I'm glad to have uh, all of you here today. Um, if you're interested in our research papers, um, we publish them once a week. I scan them in from paper documents like this one. See if it's going to show. There, you can kind of see it. Oh, that's cool. You see just the logo, but not, not the page. I like that. But anyway, that's, that's what the transactions look like. Um, and uh, this is actually the last one, this is 1994. I have gone through uh, 25 years worth of transactions, which were our published um, papers, which were given to the members and that's all. So I have to go back into the Grand Lodge archives now and look up the minutes and, um, and go and, and get copies there at Grand Lodge headquarters. So that's gonna be an adventure. I don't know if they have scanner, scanning machines available or if I have to bring something with me or something. So. We have 70 years worth of papers and I've only got about 25 years worth out there. So there's much more and the latest ones are from 2004. So unless I got a copy of a recent one, I don't have them. So it's gonna be a challenge now for me to keep doing this weekly, but I'm gonna try. But I've done all the easy ones. And yes, Brother Adamson, he mentions he, we had a nice interview I did with uh, his uh, podcast. Uh, it's not a podcast, I guess not, it's still a video. I'm still trying to decide what a podcast is. This is close to a podcast, but since people sign in, it's not. I guess it'd be audio only if it were a podcast. So I'm still trying to sort out what technically what that means. I'm guessing a podcast is just like two people and it's audio only. Is that the definition? What do you think, Cameron? I think it's pretty um, pretty loose now. Originally it was called podcasts because they were all recorded. And people listen to them on, on iPods. Right. But I think yes, uh, that's correct. there's plenty of... Uh, I think it's uh, it's evolved to basically mean anything uh, involving a discussion okay. of two or more people. Okay. Well, so technically these count as Chris, Chris, can I get two seconds? Someone's just come to my door. Oh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The door. Go right ahead. We'll be here. We're just killing time at the moment. So, yeah. So I guess technically I've been running a podcast since January, if you want to look at it that way, or if you want to be a purist, this is an online meeting that's recorded, but I kind of do it in the spirit of a podcast. I mean, I'm obviously the host and I, I eat up most of the air except when the guest is speaking, but uh, I try to have different topics and talk about things. It's generally involved masonry or something related to masonry. So, um, but I've thought about just doing a, a podcast separately, but I'm not quite sure what, what all I do. But anyway, we're just having fun doing whatever it is we are doing here. Um, but if you are interested in the papers, please email me. If you're on the, um, if you're on our Facebook page, you can send me a direct message. That's the best way to get a hold of me is Facebook Messenger, and um, I'll be happy to sign you up for it. So uh, we actually have a poll right now, and I'd like to get more people's input on this. Uh, Brian, this is interesting. Uh, one of the brothers sent me an email, which was a copy of someone else's email, sharing my weekly email with his lodge, and I, that's great. I fully support sharing our emails, passing them on to other brothers. That's less work for me. If you're going to give it to everybody in your lodge, I only need to have one email and you're sharing it with 30 other people. Mm -hmm. But he, um, the, the guy he quoted said, this is a bit of a paradox. I don't think it's a paradox, but that's okay. He said, number one, the email has a description of a paper and the paper is attached as a PDF. That's my weekly email. And that's what I've been doing. The second is an invitation to the unstated meeting because when we have a zoom meeting coming up i put all the details for the zoom meeting at the bottom of the email now one thing 
First, I'll back up. At our last stated, which was in May, I had several brothers say, I don't get the invites to the Zoom meetings. And I said, well, you do. They're in with the research papers. They're at the bottom of the research paper every week. And they say, oh, well, I don't read the whole email. I just open up a PDF <laughs> and read it. It's like, well, so the next I started putting in the first line, read this whole email. There's a link to the Zoom at the bottom because very few of my brothers in this research lodge actually attend these meetings. It's primarily me. Um, so I'm trying to encourage the members of the lodge that's responsible for this to attend. Um, so I started putting a blurb at the top. Please read the whole email for the link. But the second part was the email I mentioned. The guy says, well, there's a previous pay or there's the most recent paper, which it isn't. It's typically like from 1994 or something, and an upcoming paper. So there are two different things. One is papers that are actually given in the lodge over the last 70 plus years. That's what I'm transcribing and put in digital form. The second is the Zoom meetings, which are all brand new. So I understand where it's somewhat confusing to people um, out there what exactly I'm doing. So I put a poll on somebody's, can somebody mute? Cameron, I think, got him. Okay. Um, yeah, somebody, when you have more than one mic, you pick up me talking through your speakers and then it keeps reverbing back for everybody. Anyway, um, the, um, the papers, oh, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the papers are from the physical lodge, the actual lodge meetings over the last 70 years. That's what we're digitizing. The unstated meetings are the weekly um, you know, these Zoom meetings, and I'm announcing an upcoming one. So one's from the past, one's coming up. I put a poll on the page because I really don't like emailing everybody multiple times. I don't think people want to get six emails a week from me. So that's why I combined the weekly email with the paper with the Zoom announcement in the same thing. So I tend to talk to the group on Facebook because I know I'm reaching most everybody, instead of sending questions through email, I put it in Facebook. Most of you on Facebook are getting the emails. Just a little background. So I put a poll out there amongst you all to say, would you rather get one email from me every week, like I've been doing, or would you rather have a separate email, one email with just the research paper, and another one just announcing the Zoom meeting if there is one? Because I want to do what's what works for the majority here. And I didn't want to send two emails a week because some people complain that's too much. So I put it out to you all. So if you have voted, if you want to go vote in the poll and tell me what you think. And I even put a note in there, Brian, about I don't even get the email, so I really don't care. Oh no, I feel embarrassed that I don't get the email, so please sign me up. I've been a miss. And no one's, no one's picked that yet and admitted they don't get the emails. Because every time, guys, this is hilarious. I put an announcement saying, hey, I'm trying to change my email because I change email hosts and occasionally try, I keep trying to improve this service and give you all a good product. And I keep finding better ways to do it. And I say, I apologize if you got, if you didn't get an email this week, cause we're changing things. Inevitably some good brother who's on the group will email and say, well, I don't get the paper at all. And I say, well, are you signed up? Well, no. I said, well, that's why you're not getting the paper. <laughs> they just happen to be in the group. So if you're in our Facebook group and you have not signed up for the email, you have to sign up for the email. You have to actually reach out to me and say, add me. Just being in the group, you will see the emails in Facebook. I'll post them every week, but you won't get the email until you make an effort to give me your email address. I know it's, it makes sense to most people. If you haven't given your email to someone, odds are they're not going to be emailing you anything. And some people don't seem to connect that concept, but hey. Not everybody can be a total techie geek like myself, so it's okay. Anyway, so that's what's going on with the Facebook group. <laughs> um, any brother have any announcements, anything they want to bring up before we bring on Gordon and I shut up for at least a couple minutes? Anyone? Anyone want to say hello? I think I've seen you all before. Adrian, why don't you tell us what lodge you're from since you're new? Uh, Walker Friendship 321, Georgetown, Ontario. Ontario. Okay. Ah, our one. Yeah. Our token. I'm about 45 minutes northwest of Toronto. Okay. Good. All right. Then we have two Canadians. Oh, and brother, um, uh, who's our other Canadian regular? Is it Neil? Neil's not here today. That's his background. 
I do notice most of you all are regulars here. And if you're here every other week, that's okay. I do like having a, a regular group that can count on being here. But all right, well, we have, it looks like we have eight. We're going to go with that. So with no further ado, I'm going to let um, uh, Brother Gordon Mitchie introduce himself, say hello, and begin his talk. Thank you very much, Worshipful Brother Christopher Douglas. Uh, hopefully, I, I should be able to share my screen. If you can allow that, Chris, that'd be great. Go ahead. Okay, Brian. Uh, Brother Chris, thank you so much for asking me to come along and talk to you this afternoon about the Victoria Cross and Freemasonry. Uh, Brian, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background before I go into the presentation, why I feel that I, I can speak about the Victoria Cross. I, I did serve in the, the British military. I was in the Royal Air Force for just over eight years uh, as a young man. And uh, as, as I will introduce to you, uh, I've met uh, a couple of VC holders and they, these people that I've met have, have really uh, made an impression on me as a person and uh, on what I try to do in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, from a Masonic point of view, I'm a past master of uh, Lodge Errol Haig in the province of Fife and Kinross. <clears throat> Errol Haig, as many of you will recognise, was the founder of uh, Remembrance in the UK. Uh, I'm currently the, the Right Worshipful Master of one of uh, our province's research lodge, the Lodge Hope of Karachi, and that's how I got to know Chris, uh, through the work that we've done during the COVID pandemic. Uh, at the Lodge Hope of Karachi, we've hosted a, a weekly lockdown lecture on a Tuesday evening, uh, 7 o'clock UK time, and everybody's more than welcome to join us. Uh, for my sins, I'm a past substitute provincial Grand Master uh, of our province. I'm a member of the Grand Council Committee of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And uh, in my professional life, I'm Head of Fundraising and Learning for Poppy Scotland. I, poppy Scotland uh, is the, the guardian of the poppy, the nation's symbol of remembrance in Scotland. We, our proper name, our company name, name is the Errol Haig Fund Scotland. And you can see there the connection back to, to my mother lodge as well. So uh, during lockdown, I've, I've tried to uh, bring my own interests of Masonic and military history together. And I've produced a, a variety of presentations, uh, one of them being the Victoria Cross and Freemasonry. It primarily focuses on the Scottish brand that have I uh, received the Victoria Cross. Uh, and this afternoon, I don't propose to go into each and every one of them, uh, but I'm, I'm going to bring out two or three that I think may be of interest to you. Gordon, be, I'm sorry, before you go on, can you explain what the Grand Committee is? Because normally we have like Committee on X, Committee on Y. What is okay. the Grand Committee? So, so the, the Grand Committee of the Grand Lodge of Scotland is the, the committee that is ultimately responsible for the, the goings on of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. So as an office bearer of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, you would be become a ex officio, a member. And there are a, a variety of brand who are elected onto the Grand Committee to serve for a period of three years. Uh, so in effect, I, I come from the, the floor to represent the brand as part of that Grand Committee. So like uh, so operations and planning, just all the things the Grand Lodge does? Kind well, of. All, all decisions that go in front of the Grand Lodge of Scotland have to come through the Grand Committee first. Okay. And the way the Grand Lodge of Scotland is a very democratic organisation, uh, any decisions have to be passed on the floor of Grand Lodge by the members of Grand Lodge. But we, we are that committee. In the same way the Lodge has a committee, uh, but all the Bern can then vote on it. Uh, the Grand Committee uh, makes those decisions. And within the Grand Committee, there are a variety of subcommittees, benevolence, administration, uh, communications, discipline. 
Uh, yeah. that, that are uh, subcommittees of the Grand Committee of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Got it. Okay, uh, thank you. That, that helps a non Scot understand. Well, we're all a little bit different. We just have separate committees for things. Sounds like yeah. the, the Lodge of the uh, Committee on Jurisprudence, which vets all, um, at all proposed changes to the Grand Lodge. So, th so that would be a subcommittee, right. in our right. terms for our constitution, that would be a subcommittee okay. of the Grand Committee. Okay, but yeah, all the other ones fall under you, so that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you, that helps. So, so Brian, the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross is the highest award for gallantry that can be conferred on a member of the British Armed Forces and was first introduced on the 29th of January, 1856, and it is inscribed for valour. In the 165, 166 year history now of the Victoria Cross, there have been 1,356 of them awarded. And what we now know from a variety of researchers, about 10% of them were Freemasons from different constitutions. Uh, from the overall total of Victoria Crosses awarded, around 25% of them were awarded posthumously. <clears throat> we know it's been awarded 1,356 times, but that's been to 1,353 individual recipients. Three have won it twice. What really inspired my interest in the Victoria Cross was in 2018, I was responsible for pulling together a lot of the commemoration services for the anniversary, the, the 100 year commemorations of the ending of the Great War. And one of the events we pulled together was uh, a concert tour called Far Far From Ypres with a lot of Scottish traditional musicians. And we took it around the country and we took it to one of the theatres in Aberdeen. And uh, we invited John Cruikshank along. John Cruikshank, uh, is the, the last living recipient of the Victoria Cross from the Second World War. Uh, he celebrated his 100th birthday <coughs> just over a, a year ago, and uh, he celebrated his 101st uh, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, and he's still in good fetal in the care home up in Aberdeen. And uh, it was a great pleasure uh, to, to meet John. Uh, like the majority of the VC holders is very humble about what he he's done and what he's achieved. And he went on uh, to have a, a, a hugely successful career in banking and insurance afterwards. Uh, but John, he was awarded his VC for sinking a German U-boat. Uh, and then despite hugely, been hugely uh, seriously wounded, uh, he, he landed his Catalina. He, he was hit in 72 places, Brian. Two very serious wounds to his lungs and 10 penetrating wounds to his lower limbs. But he got his plane back. He got his plane back to safely and he got his crew back to safely. Uh, but when you meet the man, and I, I sat down next to him and we were having a bit blether about the conversation, uh, about the... the the concert that we just put on and you can still see at that time he was 98 99 and he still had a twinkle in his eye and uh, it was it was very humbling Ryan, because he knew that he was a vc holder he knew that i knew that he was a vc holder and he knew that i was in awe of him but he was just like as we see in scotland we're all jock camson's berms uh, so it was a great pleasure so after that i thought i i need to find out more about John and other VC holders. So I started researching it because of lockdown. Uh, uh, and it took me back to the Crimean War. The Crimean War was the, the, a conflict that happened between uh, in 1853 between Russia and an alliance made of the Ottoman Empire, which is now uh, Turkey, France, United Kingdom and uh, Sardinia. And you can see there from the map uh, that that area uh, that the, the war fought uh, Crimea uh, is famous for a couple of things, the, the, the thin red line uh, of the Argyles you can see there and the, the charge of the Light Brigade, uh, all, all very much things of, of boys' own magazines. Uh, 
the the 93rd Southern Highlanders went on to become the Argyllan Southern Highlanders and have got a, a great uh, Victoria Cross tradition as well. Uh, and the Charge of the Light Brigade was one of those uh, momentous uh, British military uh, occasions that, albeit happened well over 150 years ago, uh, is still talked about today in military circles. The other famous lady that came out of the Crimean War was uh, Florence Nightingale. Uh, she was an English social reformer, statistician, and she's credited with being the founder of modern nursing. Uh, what I did find out in my research is, Brian, that uh, there was a, a, a lodge named after her under the United Grand Lodge of England, the Florence Nightingale Lodge number 706, which was warranted about the time of the Crimean War. Uh, but interestingly, her, her grandmother died at Tapton Hall in Sheffield in Yorkshire. And Tapton Hall, which was a, a, a country estate, is now uh, the Masonic Hall in Sheffield. They, they, they bought it over and it's a home to all Sheffield Freemasonry. And uh, I, I had been privileged to visit that in the past, Bern, albeit totally unaware of this Victoria Cross and Crimean War connection. <clears throat> so, in it, February 1854, William Howard Russell uh, was sent to Crimea. Uh, he was asked by John Delane, the editor of the, the, the Times, the London Times, uh, probably one of the most famous newspapers in the world, uh, to accompany the Brigadier of Guards. Uh, he then became pretty much what we would consider the first modern day war correspondent. Uh, albeit it still took time for his stories to get back, uh, Telegraph was beginning to come into its own. So unless, whereas in the past it took three, four, five months for the stories to come back, stories were coming back from the front in a matter of days and weeks. At around that time, when we look at uh, military honors, uh, the Legion d'Honor was in existence. Uh, the Legion d'Honor is the highest French order of merit for military and civilian. Uh, it was established by Napoleon in 1802. Uh, it's presented in the name of the President of France, uh, who is the Grand Master of the Order. Now, you think about that; those words, Brian, uh, there's a, to me, there's a Masonic uh, connotation. And you can see there on the screen, I... Uh, uh, a copy of the, the Legion d'Honor. In Masonic terms, however, if you're a member uh, of the 18th degree of the ancient accepted Scottish rite, and this is a, a Scottish past most wise sovereign's jewel, and when you lay that side by side with the Legion d'Honor, uh, there's a huge amount of similarities, Brian, uh, and albeit the Napoleon wasn't a, a Mason. I think he had a lot of Masons around him. And uh, I like to speculate that uh, there was certainly some sort of Masonic connection within the Legion d'Honor. Uh, as we're speaking to the Virginia Lodge of Research, Brian, uh, it's only fitting that we <coughs> also talk about the Medal of Honor, uh, the, the, the highest award for valor within the United States military. And you can see the, the three different uh, medals there for the three services. Uh, what we know, Brian, there are 235 known Freemasons. I do have a full presentation of the Medal of Honor, uh, but before I continue talking about the, the Victoria Cross, I felt for this audience, I would just uh, introduce a little Masonic context for it. The Medal of Honor is the United States uh, highest military decoration, as I, as I stated. Uh, it's awarded in the name of the US con Congress and only to US military personnel uh, by the President of the United States. The recipients must have distinguished themselves, and I quote, Conspicuous, conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of their own life, above and beyond the call of duty, in action against an enemy of the United States. And what we do know, due to the nature of this medal, like the Victoria Cross, it is commonly presented posthumously. 
There is a Masonic connection, as we will find out shortly about the Victoria Cross with the founding of the Medal of Honour. And the driving force behind uh, the, the institution of the Medal of Honour was uh, Gideon Wells, who at the time uh, was the Secretary uh, of the Navy. Uh, Brother Wells was a member of St John's Lodge No. 4 in Connecticut. <clears throat> and when you look at the, the symbolism and the, the, the allegory uh, around the, the Medal of Honor, I think you can see a lot of Masonic connections. Uh, and when you look a little bit closer at, at each of them, you can see from the left hand side, the Army's Medal of Honor, slightly different to the Navy and Marine Corps and the Coast Guard's one and different again to the Air Force one. Uh, you can see things that I think are subtly Masonic, uh, Wisdom, uh, and you can see on Minerva's helmet, uh, the, the, the Owl of Wisdom. Uh, Roman mythology talks about Minerva being the goddess of wisdom, and she, especially uh, associated with strategic warfare. Uh, the stars, I think, are also symbolic. They're symbolic in Freemasonry as well. Uh, and the, the symbolic of the heavens and the divine goal which man has aspired to since time immemorial. So to me, there's a lot of connections. What also interested me about the Medal of Honor when I was doing this research, Brian, being a, a, a Scottish Freemason uh, and finding out that there was a Masonic connection. And as a kid, we'd, we'd, everyone has heard about Custer's Last Stand and the Battle of Little Bighorn. But unknown, unbeknown to me, I, Peter Thompson, uh, who was born and bred in Markinch Fife. Uh, Markinch Fife is where I'm sitting just now, Brian. I, I'm born and bred also in Markinch Fife. Uh, but Brother Peter Thompson was uh, awarded the Medal of Honour. And I, I feel uh, a, a slight connection to him because I went to the same church as him. Uh, his name's in the, the same church records as I am. We're both Freemasons, we're both from Mark Inch. The, the major difference is I, I don't have the Medal of Honour, but uh, Brother Thompson does. And uh, that, that really got me inspired to, to look at the, the wider story about the Medal of Honour. Uh, but just looking at Peter, uh, he was a Scottish soldier who fought in the Indian Wars. Uh, he, he was a member of the Golden Star Lodge number no. nine and led South Dakota. And uh, on June the 25th, 1876, which is just a, a few weeks away, uh, he and a companion fell behind but continued on towards the river. And they were unable to join the, 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 the company, uh, the company that was decimated in the end. Uh, but he got back and although he was wounded, he, with that group that was left, uh, he crossed the lines to get water uh, while he was continuing to fight hostile Indians. Uh, he was later discharged at Fort Meade in the Dakota Territory in 1880. And he then continued working in a variety of businesses, mining businesses and everything. Uh, and ultimately, uh, he passed away and he was buried uh, with full military honours in Grave 1, Section 9 of the Masonic Block in the Westlade Cemetery. And you can see the two memorials to him that uh, indicate uh, his Medal of Honour. So when I was looking at uh, for Valor, I thought that was lovely. A Medal of Honour holder came from uh, the small town that I live in in Scotland. And just to give you an example of how far that man travelled, uh, from Mark Inch, the Battle of Little Boycon was 4,156 miles away. Uh, Carter Springs, where he farmed, was four, over 4,000 miles away. And... Uh, Hot Springs, where he died, was 4,148 miles away from us. But let me come back to the Victoria Cross, Brian, because that's why uh, I've been asked to speak to you today. <clears throat> Captain Thomas Scoble, Royal Navy, uh, made an address, a, a formal proposal to the House of Commons in the UK and London. That a humble address be presented to Her Majesty. Her Majesty being Queen Victoria at the time, to institute an order of merit to be bestowed upon persons serving in the Army or Navy for distinguished and prominent personal gallantry during the present war. 
and to which every grade and individual may be admissible. Because at that time, Ren, it was generally the officer classes that were recognised. Henry Pelham, Duke of Newcastle uh, at the time, uh, he, he was uh, the Secretary of War and he wrote to Prince Albert, uh, Queen Victoria's husband, and uh, he followed it up with a speech in the House of Lords. And the way that the, the UK parliamentary system says you need both houses to be pretty much in agreement. However, Henry Pelham, uh, before he could take this idea forward from Captain Scoville, he was to lose, lose his role as the Secretary for War uh, to the Earl of Dalhousie, uh, more, and he was more commonly known as Lord Panmure. Fox Mall Ramsay, Lord Panmure. He was a Freemason realm, and he was the Senior Grand Warden of the United Grand Lodge of England in 1832. He became the Deputy Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge in 1857. But from a Scottish point of view, and more importantly, he was a Grand Master Mason of the Grand Lodge of Scotland in 1867. And he was a Provincial Grand Master for some 20 odd years of the neighbouring province to where I am in Fife and Kinross as a Provincial Grand Master of Forfarshire. Uh, so he then followed up uh, the approach to Queen Victoria. <laughs> and Queen Victoria uh, took a, a great interest and wanted this to happen. Uh, and it was very much for her that some of the wording or, and the way that the Victoria Cross came around has, has uh, in the, the current fashion. Uh, originally, it was suggested that for the brave be inscribed on it, but she decided to change that for valour because she considered all her soldiers brave. And uh, when she was looking at the original drawings to it, uh, the, the, the originators behind it uh, she suggested to her a, a design being the Army Gold Cross from the, from the Peninsular War. And you can see, Brian, that there is a similarity to, from that medal to what we ended up with, with the Victoria Cross. Uh, but it wasn't a case of her civil servant saying, this is what we're doing. Uh, Her Majesty Queen Victoria very much took a, a great interest in it. The original royal warrant for the Victoria Cross stated that the award should be ordained with a view to place all persons on a perfectly equal footing in relation to eligibility for the decoration, that neither rank nor long service nor wounds nor any other circumstance or condition whatsoever, save the merit of conspicuous bravery, shall be held to establish a sufficient claim to the honour. One of the researchers, uh, Brother Granville Anvil, when he was looking into it, one of the Masonic researchers, he suggested that the, the two ribbon colours are very Masonic in nature. And you might question, say, why, why are you talking about two ribbon colours when obviously the, the Victoria Cross is uh, crimson? But when it was uh, started off, Brian, uh, there were two ribbon colours. Uh, there was a, what is termed as a Masonic blue, uh, for the Navy, uh, and that was taken from the, the Craft Past Masters dual ribbons. Uh, and it wasn't until the foundation and the formation of the Royal Air Force in 1918 that it was decided to standardise the, the ribbon as crimson instead of having three separate ribbons uh, in the way that the, the United States Medal of Honour has three separate uh, jewels attached to it. Uh, Lord Panmure uh, approached a variety of jewellers uh, to, to find out if they'd be interested in producing the Medal of Honour, uh, but Mr Charles Hancock was the one that said yes, uh, because uh, he, he was prepared to prepare 106 different specimens for them. Uh, they, they were a company of good repute at the time. Uh, and since the inception of Victoria Cross Brown, they are the only company ever to have uh, produced the Victoria Cross. Uh, and you can see the left hand picture is their uh, notebook that contains the listing of every Victoria Cross that has been produced. <coughs> and uh, every Victoria Cro Cross is slightly different. Uh, we can't go into those details, Bern, because we don't want to uh, allow uh, the, the fraudsters to, to make a fake one. And I'll 
give you a reason for that in a, a minute or so. But when they were looking at what the Victoria Cross should be made of, I, one of the things that Queen Victoria stated was she didn't want it to be valuable uh, in monetary terms. She wanted it to be uh, something that the value came from the action. And it was uh, suggested that uh, the gun should then be made from uh, bronze. And it just happened to be that there was a couple of Russian cannons uh, that had been captured in the Crimean War uh, that the Hancocks said they could use to make the die for it. And there's always been a, a story behind it that uh, they were Russian cannons. But what's been found out now, Brian, that the cannons were actually of Chinese origin, you see, and uh, albeit they were used in Russia. Uh, but they fitted the criteria that uh, ensured that the Queen's expressed desire that there was no monetary value to the medal. Unlike today, Brian, uh, on the 14th of April, just three months ago, a Victoria Cross was sold for in excess of £200,000. Uh, that Victoria Cross belonged to Private James Towers. Uh, it was a, a Victoria Cross from the First World War. So people out there are collecting and learned they've become very valuable, which really goes against what Queen Victoria wanted. The first person to be uh, awarded the, uh, the Victoria Cross was Charles Davis Lucas. Uh, he was a lieutenant at the time. He wasn't a Freemason Brown, and he was awarded it for an action in the Island Islands in Finland. Um, and if you look at the date, it was 1854. And if you remember from the beginning that the, the Victoria Cross wasn't instituted in it until 1856, but some of the early uh, awardees uh, were from actions beforehand. Uh, when you're looking at Masonic Victoria Cross recipients, Brian, there, there's a, a great resource out there. There's uh, three or four books, uh, Granville Angel, Philip Meg, George Cross, Bob Cooper uh, have pulled these together and they're very interesting reads, Brian, and uh, I would encourage you all to join them. Uh, to purchase them for your own lodge uh, Masonic libraries uh, and they've been invaluable to me to help me pull together this presentation. The first Freemason then Brian, to be awarded the Victoria Cross was uh, Major General Edward Bell uh, and that was for an action at the Battle of Alma. Uh, he was a member of the 23rd Regiment of Foot which later became the, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and I know we've got a couple of Canadians with us and you'll be proud to, to realise that uh, he was a member of a, a Canadian lodge, St Paul's Lodge number 12 at the time, uh, now number 374 in Montreal. Gordon, what does gazetted mean? You go back so the London Gazette is, uh, the, is the London Gazette and so all the uh, medals, uh, anything that the, the royal family or the, or the, the, the government do is listed in the London Gazette. And so when it's gazetted, that's when uh, it's announced officially that they've received it. And the, the London Gazette continues to this day. So uh, today we've got the, the trooping of the colour in the, the United Kingdom and the Queen's birthday honours list has been announced. So people will receive the OBE, the MBE, CBE, and their names will be listed in the, the London Gazette. And that's where gazetted comes from, Christopher. So uh, the first Freemason to be invested, and there's a distinction between invested and one brand, uh, because at Hyde Park, uh, Queen Victoria came together, and you can see from that image, she, she's sitting on her charger there, and uh, she presented uh, around about 65 Victoria Cross holders with her medal. And there's a lovely story, Brian, about why they changed the 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 pin on the back because she was leaning over and the original designs only had one uh, pin and uh, it nearly fell off one of those she was investing and the the vc now has two pins on the back because of that uh hewitt was a member of zetland lodge under the english constitution 
the the most recent Masonic uh, holder uh, recipient of the Victoria Cross is Johnson Bahari. He was a land sergeant in the Prince of Wales Royal Regiment uh, and subsequently became a member of Queensman's Lodge, uh, which was the regimental lodge of the Prince of Wales uh, for an action in Iraq in 2005. And you can see him there uh, next to the Duke of Kent in the United Grand Lodge of England. If you're really interested in this subject, Bren, I would really encourage you to go to the Masonic Great War Project, uh, if you just Google that. And that, that's a project that talks about uh, English Freemasons in the First War. <coughs> and uh, it lists uh, a, a variety of, of people, but particularly it talks about the 64 English Constitution Freemasons who were awarded the Victoria Cross. And from my understanding, when you look at uh, individual lodges, Zetland Lodge had six recipients and the Navy Lodge over its course of, of its life has had 15 recipients. The Navy Lodge itself considers itself the premier naval lodge in the world and has had the privilege of having kings and princes and dukes and explorers. And Brian, I would encourage you to, to Google the Navy Lodge. Grand Valangio uh, pushed for uh, a commemoration during the, the period of 2014-2018 to commemorate English uh, Freemasons who were awarded the Victoria Cross and uh, this uh, monument was uh, presented to the Grand Lodge of England, United Grand Lodge of England and it's still there and you can see the sculptress uh, pointing out the details to the Duke of Kent. Uh, Outside the Grand Lodge of England, now in Great Queen Street, there is a Masonic a Victoria Cross pavement there, and 64 of the Masonic VCs are uh, remembered as you walk along that area in central London. Uh, three of them uh, include the, the six VCs before breakfast uh, that happened at Gallipoli. I won't go into that uh, this afternoon, Brian, for time, but in one of my other presentations, I, I talk more about those, Brian. Another famous Masonic connection with the Victoria Cross. Uh, in, the United, in, in the US, you've got McCoys, uh, who are seen as the leading uh, supplier of Masonic regalia potentially. In the UK, Toy Kenning and Spencer have that designation. But when you go back in history and you, you talk about Alfred Toy, uh, he was one of the, the forebears of that organisation. He was awarded the Victoria Cross. Uh, so many of us are, are wearing his company's uh, regalia. We, we just don't appreciate that. He, he was a Victoria Cross holder. Uh, he joined Freemasonry in Gracia Lodge in Egypt in 1930. Um, so coming back to Scotland, Brian, uh, and the, the area that's uh, of greatest of interest to me, uh, we talked about the 1,356 VCs being awarded. Uh, of that, we know roughly 12% were Scots or Scots-born. Bear in mind that Scotland makes up about 7% of the, the United Kingdom population. Uh, we were certainly punching. And of that, uh, of the... Masonic recipients, uh, roughly 22% were Scottish born. <clears throat> and when you look at the numbers of, of uh, Scots that served in the First World War in particular, and you look at the percentages, uh, I think we, we should be very proud of our heritage uh, as Scottish and as Scottish Freemasons. Uh, 12% of them, and there's some other imagery Brian. But let me introduce you to a couple of Ayrshire, Brian, first. Uh, the nave of Westminster Abbey, Brian, uh, very close to the, the grave of the unknown warrior. Uh, there's a joint memorial stone to the holders of the Victoria Cross uh, and holders of the George Cross, which was unveiled in 2003. And Brother Archie Chalmers, who I, I'm privileged to call a, a very dear friend, uh, is a past provincial grand master of the provincial grand lodge of Ayrshire. He's a, a grand office bearer of grand lodge of Scotland. Uh, back in 2003, he wrote to grand lodge of Scotland, and at that time he'd be a relatively junior uh, Freemason, Brian, and he convinced them to send a, 
a donation of a thousand pounds uh, towards that memorial. Uh, so Brother Archie ensured that the Scottish connection <coughs> was there. And more recently, another Ayrshire brother, uh, Brother John Muir, has been uh, selling uh, Masonic Mark tokens and has been encouraging lodges that have got a VC holder uh, to produce a Mark token and uh, with the, the description uh, of the lodge on one side and the, the name and the Victoria Cross and the date uh, awarded on the other side. And these have been sold primarily for uh, money for the organisation that I work for, Poppy Scotland, which I'm truly grateful for, uh, but also for some other military charities. But again, it's keeping the, the alive, those stories of those Masonic VC holders. So, Brian, I don't propose to go into the, the all the Masonic VC holders. What I've done for, for the final part of this presentation is brought two or three from my own province to life uh, that I think may be of interest to you. Uh, but when we look at the, those 57 uh, VC holders from Scotland, uh, 48, I believe, were Freemasons of a Scottish Lodge, three were Freemasons from a Scottish Regiment, and six were Freemasons of Scottish origin. And in my own province, Fife and Kinross, we've got two that we can complete, uh, take credit for. Uh, one a member of Union 250 and one a member of Elgin and Bruce, number 1077. So the first brother I'll introduce you to is uh, David Hunter. Uh, he was a corporal in the Highland Light Infantry and a member of Lodge Union 250. He received his VC for an action at Mouvray in France on the 17th of September. Uh, he was detailed to take on an advanced position uh, in shell holes very close to the enemy. Uh, there was no opportunity for him to, to look around the area. And uh, the, the later, the next afternoon, he found him, him and his, his uh, squad very isolated. Uh, but he was determined to hold out despite them all being exceedingly short of food and water. And he managed to maintain their position for over 48 hours until a counterattack received them, relieved them. Uh, he, he frequently repelled many attacks uh, and attacks from both sides uh, because they were coming right over his post. And uh, there was a, a very famous pipe tune. If you like the pipes, Brian, uh, please Google the Seven Heroes of Movies pipe tune. And I, I can I guarantee the hairs on the back of your neck will rise. In civilian life, uh, he came home to Dunfermline. Uh, Dunfermline is within a, my province, as I said, and it's about 10 miles from where I am just now. And uh, he went back to work as a miner uh, in Kingsseat, uh, the west of Fife, uh, the, the south of Fife is a, a, a huge mining community, Brian. Uh, and he came out of the pit because uh, of health and he served as a postie uh, for nearly 30 years and he came quite famous as his postie. And there's a lovely story uh, about 1962, a few years, a couple of years before his death. He was going to sell his old Morris car burn because it had failed its road test and he didn't really have the, the money. And his family urged him to sell the VC, maybe not for the £200,000 you're getting plus for them now, uh, but they felt like you need the money. Uh, it's just a medal. Uh, you need this to keep you going. But... Uh, a car deal in London stepped in uh, and provided him with a new car on the condition that he didn't sell his Victoria Cross. And his old regiment, they stepped forward uh, to say that they'd be prepared to purchase it uh, and set to ensure that he could keep it until he died, but it was then left to the regimental museum, which did happen. Uh, when he did die, Brian, in 65, uh, unfortunately, due to circumstance, he was buried in an unmarked grave. Uh, and then a good few years later, 20 odd years later, uh, 30, well, more than that, 30 odd years later, uh, the, the local lodge, the Highland Fusiliers Association, came together uh, to place a memorial stone over uh, David Hunter's uh, grave. So that was it back in 2004. And then in 2018, Dunfermline Athletic, the local football club, came together with the history group and uh, 
David Hunter was a season ticket holder at the Pars, and they wanted to recognise him. And Bern, uh, I, I was very privileged uh, because of my, my working environment uh, as head of fundraising at Poppy Scotland uh, to be present at the anniversary, the opening of uh, and the, the dedication and consecration of the bench and the plinth and the, the mayor of Moveley came over, uh, the family were there and along with the Lord Lieutenant of Fife and Conross, uh, we were uh, two of the, the speech makers on the day and Brian, I, I can tell you I've had been privileged over the last five or six years, been involved in many commemorations, uh, but this one really touched me uh, because uh, he was from my local area and uh, I got to know some of his family uh, relatively well. The other Victoria Cross holder I'll introduce you to is brother Adam Archibald, who's a member of uh, Elgin and Bruce. Uh, Elgin and Bruce is a mother lodge uh, of Lord Delgin, uh, probably Scotland's greatest Freemason, or uh, certainly the, the greatest Masonic family that's come out of Scotland. Uh, Archibald was born in Leith, uh, and you probably walked on his pavements because he worked for the Stuart's Granolithic Stone Company uh, that has been responsible for uh, revolutionising footpath paving burn around the world. Uh, he was a footballer in his younger days. Uh, he played for St Bernard's and I've got a lovely connection to St Bernard's as well, Bern, because the, the Lady Hay Poppy Factory where I work that produces the uh, the Scottish poppy, uh, all by hand by disabled veterans, is on the site of St Bernard's Ground. And uh, as a quirk of fate and as one of those quiz questions, Bern, uh, that ground that we now uh, have our buildings on uh, is the only time that the Scottish Football Cup final has been played outside Glasgow. And it's now our factory car park. Uh, St Bernard's also had a military connection uh, because the, the football club was originally the, the football club of the 3rd Edinburgh Rifle Volunteers. Wilfred Owen, one of the, the Masonic, uh, the, the, the Great War Poets, also has a connection to Adam Archibald because uh, they were together at the same time and at the same place. And I always like to think that he probably then walked on uh, Archibald's pavements when he was back in Edinburgh recovering. Uh, Owen, not a VC holder, but a military cross holder, Brian. Uh, and you can see they were together, very close from where Owen was hit and killed. Uh, Archibald was part of the Royal Engineers who were to bridge the canal at Urs, uh, at Urs Lock. And you can see there the, the uh, a, a contemporary photograph of uh, the canal that they were trying to, to bridge Bern. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I just like to think that those two Bern uh, came together at some point. Uh, Archibald was initiated into the craft uh, before the war um, and uh, the lodge uh, Lord Delgan's Lodge decided to present Archibald with a full set of Masonic regalia afterwards. Uh, that couldn't happen in his mother lodge because of his uh, poor health after the war. But Lord Delgan uh, afterwards uh, took a sojourn over to Edinburgh and presented him with the regalia in his Edinburgh Lodge that he affiliated to St James's Operative Lodge in Edinburgh. And interestingly, St uh, James's Operative Lodge also have another VC holder within their ranks. Uh, Robert Lloyd Lindsay, Lord Wantage, uh, another friend with a, a, a huge connection to locally to me, a senior Freemason, as you can see, senior Grand Warden of United Grand Lodge of England, provincial Grand Master for Berkshire. Um, but he, he was the, the leading light in the set of the, the British Red Cross in the United Kingdom. And again, that shows to me the connection with the good and the great uh, of that day with civil society. Uh, less so nowadays, unfortunately, but back in the day. But when he was setting up, uh, Lloyd Lindsay uh, had a letter published in the Times and he pledged £1,000 of his own money, which was a lot of money, Brian. And uh, on the back of that letter to the Times, uh, 
the British Red Cross I came to be founded. <coughs> his connection to the, the province is that he, his family is the Earls of Crawford and Balcaris. Uh, the Earl of Balcaris is a title in the Peerage of Scotland, uh, created in the 1600s. Uh, and Robert was the second son of Lieutenant General James Lindsay and Anne, daughter of Sir Coote's Trotter Baronet. His great grandfather was James Lindsay, the fifth Earl of Balcaris. And uh, in my province here in Fife and Cross, we have got a Lodge Balcaris that meets in Collinsborough, and they proudly wear the Lindsay tartan, and they, they are basically within the estate. Uh, and that's me a few years ago, Brian, uh, at the installation or uh, being one of the installing masters uh, at the Lodge Balcaris's installation. Uh, John McCauley, uh, another VC holder, Brian, uh, he, oh no not a, a Fife Freemason, a Glasgow Freemason, he was born in the Kingdom of Fife. Uh, and there was a fantastic poem written about him. Uh, His heart and soul were in the fight to crush the wrong and guard the right, and sever that sword that makes weak nations cower, that deadly poisonous hunnish power forever. Uh, true boy's own story uh, about him. Uh, Alexander Hoare Riven, uh, the first ever Gowrie uh, is another Scottish Freemason that I uh, pull out of them all. Uh, he was initiated in the St Andrew's Military Lodge, uh, number 668, and he affiliated to the Reginald Wingate Lodge while serving in Sudan. Uh, he was involved in the, the Maddest War uh, between uh, the Sudanese religious leader, Muhammad Ahmad bin Abd Allah, uh, who proclaimed himself the Mahdi of Islam, uh, the guided one and uh, against the, the forces of the Kerev of Egypt. Uh, and Kerev Mohammed Tuvik Pasha, as you can see, uh, was a Freemason. And so there was a, a lovely connection there. Uh, Hor Riven uh, went down to become the governor of South Australia. Uh, but interestingly, Brian, he was not eligible to become Grand Master uh, as he wasn't yet a past master. Uh, he joined the United Services Lodge on the 25th of April, 1929, uh, and a year later he was appointed Worshipful Master, and uh, 10 days before being installed, he was installed as a Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Australia, uh, with a little bit of dispensation, because he was entitled. Uh, afterwards, there's a variety of lodges named uh, after him. David Lauder Byrne, uh, he was a cousin of uh, Harry Lauder, uh, which is probably one of Scotland's uh, biggest exports. Uh, Harry Lauder was initiated in Lodge Dramatic. Uh, and at that time, Byrne, uh, Lauder was the highest paid performer in the world and the first British artist to sell more than a million records. Uh, but a lot of the profits that he made, he put into uh, the Harry Lauder Million Pound Fund for Disabled Soldiers, which then went on to become Blesma here in the UK. But when we're looking at our Victoria Cross Freemasons, Brian, and uh, th there's always questions, was he a Freemason or not? And one of the books I, I talked about earlier, Brian, John Noble Graham was listed as a Freemason. He was a colonel in Argyll and Southern Highlanders, and it states it was a member of Lodge Union uh, 310 in Carlisle. Uh, for me, as the, the master of the, the Lodge Hope of Karachi, it's quite interesting that he was also chairman of the Karachi uh, Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he was a, a senior officer in Scotland's uh, highest civil order, the most ancient, most noble order of the Thistle. And he was the gentleman usher of the Rod of the Green Order of the Thistle, which has subsequently been taken on by Brother Reverend Canon Joe moral past Grand Master, you can see in the photograph. His funeral was held at St John's Kirk in Edinburgh, and again, the, the interesting part for me is that his collection was to be given to the organisation that I now uh, lead up the fundraising for. But what's really interesting, Brian, there's no evidence that he's a Freemason, and certainly the lodge in Carlisle, uh, there is no recollection of him being a Freemason, in their records, uh, and I just over lockdown spoke to their secretary who double checked uh, their membership book. And so that one's still to be found out, Brian. So of the 57 other uh, 
Freemasons, Scottish Masonic, Freemasons, Brian, I'm not going to go through them all. I'll just mention the names. Leslie Andrew Wilton, William Bapti, Colin Barn, William Bloomfield, Walter Brodie, Thomas Cadell of Kikensey. Interestingly, he was the only uh, Grand Lodge of Scotland office bearer. Uh, he was a sword bearer of Grand Lodge of Scotland in 1911-1912. Thomas Caldwell, John Carmichael, John Christie, uh, William Hugh Clark Kennedy, uh, Neville uh, Joseph Anna Coghill. Uh, for those who have watched the film Zulu Dawn, Brian, uh, Coghill and the Standard are, are the main part of that story. Uh, he was a Freemason, uh, Brian. Uh, Omar Crea, uh, Cruikshank, uh, James Davis Kelly, uh, Alexander Edwards, William John English, Donald Farmer, George Finlater, uh, Samuel Frickleton, John Gilroy Grant, uh, William Henry Grimbleson, uh, Arthur Henderson, Herbert Stephen Henderson, James Palmer Huffham, Henry Knight, John Jock McGregor, again, Brian, uh, a very interesting one for the Canadians. He was a captain uh, in the 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifles, 1st Central Ontario Regiment. He was a member of the Thai Lodge No. 66, Pearl River, British Columbia, and they affiliated to the Westview Lodge No. 133. Uh, he was uh, awarded his VC for an action at Cambrai, uh, gazetted in 1919. He was born uh, in Codder near Nairn. And Brian, he was Can Canada's most highly decorated soldier uh, and is still until this day. Henry May, uh, Robert Gordon Macbeth, uh, William Fraser MacDonald, Brian. This is an interesting one because every month we're finding new ones and we feel that we now have evidence that he is a, a Scottish Freemason uh, because of birth, but we're still very much researching that. Stuart McPherson, uh, George McIntosh, you can see being presented to the King, uh, uh, Matthew Fontaine, Maury Michaeljohn, Charles Melvin, Cyrus Wellesley Peck, James Douglas Pollock, uh, Harry Sherwood Rankin, uh, John Canshaw Rains, William Reed, and Bern, uh, after the presentation, I've got a small connection with William Reed because one of the other uh, researchers of the Scottish Masonic VCs, he, he gifted me uh, a Christmas card that Bill Reed uh, sent. Uh, it was part of the, the Victoria Cross collection from the Victoria and George Cross Society, and I'm a uh, a uh, privilege to have that in my personal collection now. <coughs> uh, Thomas Ricketts, uh, Walter Potty Ritchie, uh, Frederick Slay Roberts, Lord Roberts, Bobs. Uh, Brian, I do another presentation on Bobs. Uh, he, he is the archetypical Victorian uh, general and uh, what a man and mason he was, but that is a, a full hours presentation as well, Brian. William Robertson, he went on to become a Lieutenant Colonel in the Gordon Highlanders, and he was the first chairman of the Lady Poppy Factory, and I've mentioned that factory a few times because it's a place of, uh, of my work now, uh, Brian, and I'm very proud of the Masonic connection uh, with remembrance in the United Kingdom. George Mackenzie Sampson, uh, th there's a, a tragic story behind George Sampson. He, he came home. Uh, and he was asked to uh, attend a, a civic reception in the local park in Montrose. And he, he got off the train, Brian. He was in his civilian clothes and uh, he was walking towards the park. And as you can see in that uh, newspaper, uh, two ladies handed him the white feather. The white feather, as we know, is a symbol of cowardice. And uh, I just hope that they were truly ashamed when they arrived at the civic reception in the park and they realised that the, the, the man that they'd given the white feather to in civilian clothes was the man that were actually there to congratulate and celebrate. And that man was Seaman George Mackenzie Sampson. Uh, so it just goes to show, never judge a book by his cover, Brian, because they assume because he was a civilian, gear and he was of fighting age, he should have been uh, 
overseas and he was awarded his VC at Gallipoli. Robert Shankland, Ross Tollerton, Ernest Beechcroft Beck with Taos, uh, John Vowsden, Sir George Stuart White and Jacob Vies or Jake, Jack White, uh, the only uh, member of the, the Jewish community in Scottish Freemasonry that was awarded the VC. John Augustus Wood. Bern, there's so many people I need to thank for bringing this together. They're listed there. Uh, my challenge when I present this in Scotland is to the lodges, are there other Miss Sc Scottish Masonic BC recipients out there that we do not know about? If you've got snippets in your archives, please let us know. Bern, for Valor, thank you for listening. And not to take away from any single person who has won the Victoria Cross, but those from the medical world and from the musical military world, to me, are the bravest of the brave, Brian, because they were playing the bagpipes and in, or sounding the pea block and inspiring them, Brian, to go across those trenches and not able to defend themselves, or they were fixing the wounded and again, not able to defend themselves. And those stories are, to me, that little cut above. Thank you so much for inviting me along to the Virginia Lodge of Research to give you this short insight into the Masonic and particularly the Scottish Masonic connections with the Victoria Cross. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Nietzsche. Um, I had a question for you or a, a follow up on Napoleon. You mentioned Napoleon not being related to a Mason. Uh, one of my previous papers I gave on the diverse Grand Lodge of the France in researching uh, 1804, this shortly after de Grasse Tilly returned from um, the Western Hemisphere. We had set up the, the mother uh, Supreme Council of Scottish Rite. Uh, several Scottish master lodges, which is the precursor to Scottish Rite, were at odds with the Grand Orient of France, established the General Scottish Grand Lodge of the Rite Ancient and Accepted, REAA. Uh, they installed Prince Louis Bonaparte as Grand Master, and de Grasse Tilly was his deputy. That was on October 22nd. On a, November 27th of that year, Louis' older brother, Joseph Bonaparte, becomes the Grand Master of the Grand Orient of France, the one that were at odds with the Scottish Masons, and Louis became his deputy Grand Master. And then on December 1st, Louis's older brother, Napoleon Bonaparte, the one we all know, is crowned Napoleon I, Emperor of the French by Pope Pius VII. So several of his brothers were Masons and indeed senior grand masters and such of French Masonic bodies. Louis himself never joined, uh, Napoleon himself never joined, um, never joined uh, Masonry. And I, I remember there was another snippet, I didn't have it at hand, but where Louis or Napoleon was asked something about masonry. And he says, yes, my brothers can wear their, their silly aprons and their silly gloves. They can do what they want. Kind of like, I'm going to go do manly things and you can go wear your aprons. So, so yes, he had definitely had connections to masonry uh, directly through his family, but he was not yeah. indeed a mason. Just want to add that <laughs> to the discussion there. Any questions for Brother Gordon? Question uh, here, Brother Gordon. Speak up, please, today. Uh, now, in research of these uh, Masons, uh, the Victoria Cross, were they Masons prior to receiving the Victoria Cross, or they became Masons later? What What does the statistic look like? I, I don't have the exact stats on who were Freemasons before. A good few were in the craft. The, the, the two that I talked about were Freemasons before receiving their VC, but many have uh, joined the craft afterwards. Uh, I, I like to believe that they've not been sought out to become members because they were Victoria Cross holders. Uh, but I, I think that <coughs> those uh, men that have been awarded the Victoria Cross that 
the way that they, they live their life and their, their principles are suitable for them to become members of the craft. So it, it was an easy join, as I believe is anybody who served uh, in any branch of the military, there is a, a, a a connection with the Brotherhood and Freemasonry and the way that we do. So we, we, we've got similar principles that we will all abide by. So it's an easy leap from being in the military to becoming a Freemason. Uh, but I, I don't have the stats quite all about how many were before or how many were after. That can be found out. It's just a case of right, reading through the various books and looking at the dates from the Gazette date and uh, I'm sure someone will have done that in the past someplace. Uh, by uh, by uh, comparison here, Gordon, so I know like in Vietnam, the average age of the troops was like closer to 19. And then in World War II, they were older and I believe World War One, where they're not the typical age of someone going off to war in World War One. would be a typical, what was the average age of an idea was more like late like 20s it, it, or... It was early, late, late teens, early 20s. It still was early teens. Okay. So, I mean, a lot of them, you typically can't, I mean, I imagined at the time, the, the, the age for joining the lodge was 21. Well, in Scotland, it's 18. If it you is. have come, if you're what is termed as a Lewis, that your right. father or grandfather. So but, the, the vast majority of them would have been in. Uh, <clears throat> but when you go back to the sort of uh, the 1800s, you also had the military lodges, that many of them would have joined as well. But the, the vast majority the of the Scottish Freemasons uh, were joining lodges at home uh, or the, the, their home right. lodge. So uh, so as far as at the age for joining then in the late 1800s, was that still 21? Or, I mean, it's come down a little bit recently, has it not? Or has it been? Oh, I, I look at myself, I joined at 17. Uh, oh, really? when I joined okay. the military. So it's, I, I think it's that late teens, early 20s. That's when you, you're going to do it. And I, I don't think that's really changed over the years. Okay, interesting. Uh, okay. Unless in time of war, when you then do get the conscription up to a certain age, and that, that changes the, the demographic of those who are joining. Right. But as a volunteer to the military, I think it is that you leave school, you make a decision, and uh, f- for the area that I was in, you, the sort of decision making that I had, it was the, the local paper mills, uh, the military, uh, the local uh, mines, uh, or the dockyard. Uh, that, that was your sort of, right. unless you were going on to uh, further education, et right. cetera. But, okay, very yeah. good. Okay, so I, I was just trying to get a perspective there if it's if it would be typical to be joining a lodge by the time you were in the military, and indeed it was. Also, there are a lot of military lodges and take that into account. So you, you may well join the service and then join a military lodge shortly after joining. So I do know, especially in the U.S., I don't know how this affected Great Britain and Scotland here, but um, in the U.S., the biggest influx of Masons came with the, uh, with the World War II generation coming back from the Second World War and the bond that you formed with the men. Because remember, we're over there in Europe for like three or more years yeah. in country with the same unit, with the same men, you form tight bonds of fraternity. They came back to America 45 and it's, you know, you wanted to feel that same sense of camaraderie. We, and we saw that huge, spike huge after the first world yeah. war. Okay. Yeah. But here, here was huge. I mean, the majority, and of course still have a few of them, not many, but there was a huge influx in America of World War II veterans joining the lodge between say 45 and 50. And that's been the largest increase at any time in American history of Masonic bodies. And of course, we didn't really draw in the baby boomer crowd because of all the upheavals in the 60s and 70s when they came of age, they weren't too keen on those same things being counter to their parents, counterculture, whatever. So masonry took a huge hit. Now I myself am a Gen Xer. I'm, um, I was born in '65, so I was the very first year of the Gen Xers. So my generation really didn't pick up the mantle. So it seems like masonry in the U.S. took a sharp dip. We built a whole lot of lodges. We built a whole bunch of buildings and all this in the um, mid 20th century, and now we find ourselves 
even at the end of the 90s, when I was master the first time, we were seeing the decline. Now we're 20 years into the next century where we have all of these lodges. We have 12 lodges, well, 10 lodges now in the city of Norfolk, where I tend lodge, which is near to where I live. And most of them struggle because you have so many lodges and so so few, you know, so few new uh, members joining and they pick one of the lodges to join. And we have these huge buildings that are harder to maintain because where we once had thousands and thousands of masons who are active, there's probably only several hundred. If I counted up the total number of men who set foot in Granby Street Temple uh, over the course of a year, it'd be less than a thousand total, probably more like 500 total that are active. Thus, we can't maintain these huge buildings we've built and we can't maintain these lodges. You know, they're down to 10 active members, most of them. I, I, th so I think struggle. that's similar to the UK as well. Okay. Yeah. So many, many factors lead me to it. I do think it was the generational shift that we have in your group form. But who knows? Maybe, maybe the millennials will decide they want to be Masons again and we'll have a huge influx. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's just something I was born into. When I joined, they were already on the decline. And I've seen it. We have 50,000 Masons, 57,000 Masons in Virginia when I joined, I think. And we're around 25,000 now. And that includes those that counts those who belong to multiple lodges. So there's much less than 25 distinct 25,000 actual Masons, probably more like 20. So. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, most of the sort of anglicized Western world Masonry is in the same boat uh, right. and followed a similar path on the back of both world wars. I think that'd be uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, UK, uh, okay. different constitutions would be the same. Okay. Any other questions for Brother Gordon? I really did enjoy that. You had a lot of really useful information. It was kind of neat. I appreciate the mentioning the, the Medal of Honor. It strikes me as a very similar sort of award, um, but I appreciate the, uh, um, the tie in there, but there was a lot of really interesting stuff. It was kind of fun to learn. Um, about that and, and all the bravery of those men was just, it blows me away. <laughs> yeah, I, I, one of the things when I was talking to, to other more experienced Victoria Cross researchers is you can't do the service to each and every one of them. You, you just have to pick two or three that you've got an interest in and you can really build up a, a personal story around them. And that's what I've tried to do uh, because each story is as fantastic and as brave and as awe-inspiring as the, the next one, you see. And if you were to do, uh, give each due credit, uh, the 1,300 and odd of them, we, we would be talking for days and days and days and end. Gordon, I'm uh, thinking that a Mason recently was award BC, um, a Lance Corporal or a Sergeant? Johnson Bahari was the last one, but he, he, he joined the craft afterwards. Right. And that was go through the Afghan um, conflict, wasn't uh, it? That was Iraq. He, he was, uh, that was 2005 in Iraq. Thank you. Um, I do want to make an announcement about our upcoming meetings. Um, on the 19th, which is next Saturday, we have... Uh, let's see. Um, The uh, brother D.D. D. Anderson and several other brothers from the uh, Supreme Council of Louisiana. We'll have a panel discussion with them. Um, you know, of course, in the U.S., we have four Scottish Rite councils, northern and southern, uh, basically the, uh, um, what do you call the mainstream, the original uh, northern and southern jurisdictions. And then you have the Prince Hall, northern and southern. So roughly covering the similar areas for our primarily black brethren in Prince Hall. Um, but they belong to the Supreme Council of Louisiana, which is based in Louisiana, but has charters uh, elsewhere in the US. Scottish Rite is an appended body in the US. And it was quite surprising to me as it is to other brothers to find out that there are places in the world where the first three, the craft degrees are conferred by the Scottish Rite and it is its own separate right. And I've written several papers expanding on that idea. But in the U.S., it is an appendant body, much like the Mark Master and the, the um, uh, Royal Arch and other bodies you can join after you join the Blue Lodge. But the Scottish Rite in most of the world is indeed 
its own right. You join as an entered apprentice. You get your first three degrees and then the other 29 in the Scottish right. But in the US, it's an dependent body. You get the fourth degree and so on after you've been a member of a Blue Lodge. They have their own Supreme Council. They confer all of the degrees and they're very much clandestine. Uh, I can't visit their Scottish right because they're clandestine to my Supreme Council. But they have a very interesting story. They've kind of been operating in the background for years and uh, most of us weren't even aware of them. And so I met several of them online after seeing a, a brilliant video that a brother in Louisiana published on discovering this other Scottish right that existed. It'd be interesting to contrast and compare how they do things. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, it's sort of like a, another jurisdiction within my own country. So it's got to be kind of fun talking to them. Um, I need to hurry up and book some more um, speakers because I, I'm just about out of them. So I'm not sure what we're going to have the week after that. So I suppose this week I need to knuckle down and line up more speakers to come in. Uh, but we do plan to give a talk most every Saturday. I have a few other things coming up. So I will announce if we're having one or not that Saturday. But I do have a few things coming up this uh, in June and July. But uh, for the most part, we'll be meeting every Saturday. I'll continue to announce that in the group. But we definitely will be meeting next Saturday, and that should be quite interesting. So I hope you all can attend that. And I'll do my best to get this and the last uh, Zoom meeting up on uh, YouTube here this week, too. Any brothers, anything else to offer before we close out? All right. Thank you all very much for coming. Good to see you all. Thank you again, Brother Gordon, for your... Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Christopher, for asking me. Yep, this is great. Okay, and I may have you back for one of your other talks. You mentioned a few other things that sound interesting. My pleasure. So, yep, that'll be great. Uh, anybody else has anything? Okay, good to be with you all, brothers. Thank you again for attending, and look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.